Alright guys, welcome back. A fairly quick one for you today, I think. Unit 1, Outcome 3, Knowledge 8. We are still working our way around the external business environment. We've moved now into the operating environment and the first factor we look at is customer needs and expectations. So that is what we're focusing on in this video here. So here's a study design. You can see now we've shifted down. We've covered all of the macro factors. We're now moving on to the final four factors, which all sit in the operating environment. And you can see there the first one, all it says is customer needs and expectations. So here we are again. Hopefully by now you've got this in your brain, this little diagram, it's going to be very helpful. When you're doing a SAC and you can kind of visualize where all this information kind of needs to be stored and how it kind of relates um, with each other. So there we can see your customers. That's what we're looking at today. So remember, as customers are an operating factor, the business has some degree of control. Remember, that's the difference between the macro and the operating factors. The idea that macro factors exist there in kind of uh, in, in the broader environment, we have no control over them whatsoever as a business owner. We are just simply responding to them. But one of the differences between macro and operating is that in the definition, we can say we have some degree of control over them because we have interactions with them. OK, so just pointing that out again, now we've moved into the operating environment. It's this, this degree of control. It's not that we control our customers, but we interact with them in a way which we do not interact with the macro factors. So that's kind of the key difference here between what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the outcome and what we've talked about so far. Now, it is essential that the business owner, owners, managers, whoever's running the thing, are constantly monitoring the behaviours of customers and thinking about how to best meet their needs and their expectations. Remember, the study design dot point said customer needs and expectations. That's all it said. Now, there is a difference between customer needs and expectations, okay? If you had to define customer needs, okay? What the business has got to do is make sure that during their planning stage, whatever products or services it's planning on producing or selling, that they meet the needs of their potential customers. And the needs are the essential requirements that customers are intending to fulfill when they make a purchase. The key there being the essential requirements, okay? Customer needs, the essential requirements. Customer expectations, slightly different. Okay, it's not the essential requirements that the customers are looking to fulfill, but some kind of extra value or benefit that customers might expect or anticipate when they're making purchases. Okay, so not essential is kind of like the extra stuff that you might kind of throw in on top. Okay, so it's a subtle difference, okay, between the two things. But the reality is, if a business wants to be competitive and successful today, they absolutely have to meet customer needs. If you don't, if you're not meeting customer needs, you, you kind of don't have a business, but they also want to try and meet as many of those customer expectations as they can. You need to be aware of competitors. We look at competitors next, what your competitors are doing out there. Remember you're competing against them. But you want to meet those customer expectations as much as possible so that you can kind of get one up on your competitors. Just give you a couple of examples of this idea, the difference between needs and expectations, because like I said, it's kind of subtle. So with a car, OK, a customer needs the engine to run efficiently and it ne they need the brakes to work properly. OK, they're essential for the car's operation and safety. If you don't have those things, you're not going to be selling many cars. OK, but the customer might also expect some additional features like these days, a touchscreen display. You might expect comfortable seats, an advanced sound system, so on and so forth. Hundreds of things. Now, they're not necessary for the car to function or for someone to buy it, but they enhance the experience. OK, so the difference there between needs and expectations. Another example, in a restaurant, a customer needs the food to be safe to eat and they might need it to be served in a timely manner. But the customer might also expect attentive service, a pleasant ambiance and a unique menu, for example. One final example, 
just to get the message across here. In a hotel, a customer needs a clean room and a working bathroom, but they might also expect complimentary Wi-Fi, friendly staff, and a variety of extra amenities like a gym or a pool, that sort of thing. Okay, so hopefully you get the idea there. There's some difference between customer needs, customer expectations. Needs, black and white. It's fundamental to what your, what your business is about, what you're selling. Really what we're looking at here more is the expectations. Now, just before we move on, just note some crossover here as well, because we're talking about customers. We already looked at society's attitudes and values. Now, obviously customers form part of society. So inherently, there is gonna be some kind of crossover between these two things. Okay, so we're just gonna look at a range of typical expectations that customers might have, okay? Just that you might be able to draw from when you're answering these questions, okay? So the first one might be quality, okay? So customers might expect the highest quality possible for the lowest price, well, they probably do. At the very least, they expect the quality ref to reflect the price charged, which is why with any given market, you have high-end versions and lower-end versions. Okay, those high-end versions, they're expensive, but you're getting some extra value, extra quality that reflects the price. So how can a business respond to this with their planning? Okay, so if you're looking for, if you're focusing on quality, choose your suppliers carefully. If you don't have quality supplies, chances are, the end product or service that you are producing is not going to be of high quality. Make sure that the processes the using in producing your product or your service are the best possible. And you might even implement some quality control processes. Okay, we look in some detail in that in year 12. We don't need to go into any detail here, but you can have um, some processes you put in place within your business, which focusing on quality control. So there are a few, a few ways in which if you're going to be trying to meet the expectation of quality from your customers, there's some ways and ways you can think about how to actually do that, put into practice. Next, customer service, pretty big one these days. So customers these days pretty much expect the best customer service, otherwise they'll just shop elsewhere. So it's not just about the product that's being delivered, it's about the service that customers receive alongside that. So how can you build this into your business at the planning stage, okay? How can you respond to that customer expectation? First off, staff training, okay? Simple, to train your staff to deliver the best customer service that they possibly can. Returns policies might form a part of this as well. So what happens if a customer buys a product that is faulty, goes wrong? How do you manage that returns process? And how effectively and efficiently do you deal with those issues? That can be a big one for customers. And you can you have the opportunity there to actually really turn around a very negative customer into ultimately being a positive one if that experience of dealing with the return is a good experience. Um, how can customers contact you? These days, there's so many different ways. Obviously, businesses these are using these days are using social media, um, but make it easy, convenient for customers to contact you. Um, and complaints policies look kind of linked into returns in a way. How quick are you? How quick are you going to respond to any complaints? So all this sort of stuff again all forms part of the customer service that the customers receive. So put in place strong practices around these things. Third expectation these days, CSR. Okay, we've talked about it already. We'll be talking about it again. I keep saying this, it's a very common theme throughout both the year 11 and the year 12 course. But more and more these days, customers are expecting the businesses that they buy from to be acting in a socially responsible and an ethical way. So, how can the business res respond to this one? Sourcing sustainable suppliers from ethical sources, kind of a no brainer. Focus on reducing your waste, minimizing packaging, and maybe even supporting ethical causes through donations or some other kind of way in which you can provide support. So nothing particularly new there, but now we're just framing this around meeting the customer expectation of the business acting in a socially responsible manner. And fourthly, convenience. I think probably a, 
increasingly important expectation these days, just the way that people live their lives. Um, it's all about, you know, instant gratification um, to a point. But, you know, the internet technology convenience now, I think, is a huge, huge part of business. So businesses really need to think about how they're meeting the expectation of convenience on the part of their customers. OK, customers these days expect to be able to make purchases conveniently and using methods that fit in with their lifestyles. OK, modern lifestyles, very, very different to what they were a generation or two ago. So businesses need to reflect that. So how can the business do that? Online shopping, obviously, hours of operation, um, so extended hours of operation. You know, a couple of generations ago, shops were open Saturday, but shops and shopping centres were closed on Sundays. You know, then a few shops started to open on the Sundays, and then it just kind of became the expectation. So if you went to a shopping centre now on a Sunday and a shop was closed, you'd be really surprised. Like, you're not going to see that these days. It's just now an expectation that shops are open and accessible to us seven days a week. Of course, hours of operation, if you're selling online, hours of operation are pretty much 24 seven, three, six, five. Um, a range of payment options also now for convenience, after pay, and there's other similar payment options available these days. So these days, when you go and buy particularly major purchases, there's a multitude of different ways in which you can now pay. And again, that's reflecting customer expectations of them being able to actually do this and maybe a range of delivery and pickup options. And again, you know, think Uber Eats and DoorDash. Um, there's so many different ways in which this is kind of manifested in business these days in different kinds of businesses. But again, it's all about meeting that demand for customer convenience. You know, if you're a restaurant and you want to access Customers who just want to deliver, uh, want it ordered, want it delivered to their house, you might need to be dealing with your DoorDashes and your Uber Eats if you're going to meet the needs of that particular group of customers. So another couple of things just to kind of throw as an aside, a few other things, um, not as important as those previous four, but another few things that some customers these days are looking for, maybe the ability to form long term relationships with the businesses that they deal with. OK, that's important to some people. Second one there, the ability to purchase Australian made products using local or Australian sourced resources. That's, I think, a pretty important one to a lot of Australians. Australians tend to really like Australian made um, in a way that kind of in a, in a stronger way than in most other countries, from what I've seen, certainly where I'm originally from. There's not that focus on UK or English produced things. But here in Australia, <clears throat> I really notice this I guess kind of originally being an outsider, um, you know, Aussies just love Aussie made stuff. So that's a really, really important one as well. Now, just some examples here um, to put in some context. Um, you don't need to be able to regurgitate any figures or anything here, but this is just for your understanding and just demonstrate what happens when businesses don't do this. OK, Kodak, OK, technology company dominated the photographic film market during most of the 20th century. OK, um, now, how did they fail to meet customer needs and expectations? Because you don't see much of Kodak these days. OK, they developed the world's first digital camera even. OK, that I actually didn't realize that originally till I was kind of looking this stuff up. That's amazing. But when I was your age and cameras, you needed to put film in them and, you know, take physical photos, basically had two options. It was Kodak, which was the market leader, and then it was Fuji. That was pretty much it. So Kodak, you know, were, had the film in most cameras around the world for many, many decades. Now, even though they developed the first, the world's first digital camera, they were so focused on the success of photography film that they really kind of completely missed the digital revolution. Okay, they failed to keep innovating, failed to recognize this customer expectation that we're moving into the digital age. And they went bankrupt in 2012. Now, they have come back to some extent. They've kind of reinvented themselves, um, as have all of the businesses. Actually, I'm just going to look at another couple of businesses. They've all kind of um, kind of disappeared, then kind of are making a bit of a return. But look, look at the revenues there. Kodak revenues in 1996, $16 billion. 
2023, $1.2 billion. So the, although Kodak exists still, it exists in a much smaller form than what it obviously once did. Another one, Nokia, okay? The first business to create a cellular network in the world, okay? In the late 90s and the noughties, Nokia was the global leader, leader in mobile phones, okay? If most people, if they had a phone, had a Nokia, okay? It was kind of like Apple these days. It was like the iPhone, okay? Probably half the people had Nokia phones. But what happened to Nokia, okay? How did they fail to meet customer needs and expectations? Okay, the company basically overestimated the strength of its own brand, and they believed it could arrive late to the smartphone race and still win. So they were kind of overconfident, okay? So the first iPhone, the first smartphone, the iPhone was released in 2007. Until then, we had cellular phones, but they were not smartphones. So really, the iPhone in 2007 was the first smartphone. 2008, one year after that, Nokia finally kind of came to the game um, and decided it was going to go uh, compete with Android, but it was too late, okay? Already, there was some strong Android products on the market. Obviously, Apple had taken a bit of a hold. And one year in, it was too late. Their products were not competitive enough. So there we go, 2007, Nokia's market share of the mobile phone market, pretty much 50%. In 2013, um, 3%. And actually, that second 2013 should say 2023, 3%. So it kind of had a bit of a... It, it kind of disappeared. And for the last 10, 11 years, it's still not managed to get any traction in that market. It's actually hard to find uh, market share figures for Nokia. It tends just to be lumped in with other when you look up the statistics. So again, massively, massively dropped. Tower Records, you may have heard of Tower Records, retail music chain, first to create the concept of the retail music store. At its peak, it had more than 200 locations in 20 states, 18 countries, and over a billion dollars um, in annual sales. Again, they failed to keep up with the digital revolution. Okay, The management at the time believed that digital was a fad, and it closed its final US store in 2006. Now, they relaunched in 2020 as an online retailer, but more of a focus on vinyl records, which were at that point were making a bit of a resurgence. Um, vinyl records originally kind of almost died out in the, in the 90s when CDs kind of came along. Um, but yeah, they made a bit of a resurgence, a bit of a niche market, but a growing niche market these days. And in 2022, they opened this business called Tower Labs um, in Brooklyn, New York, which is it's not really a record store at all. It's more of a little hub, a meeting space for musicians, artists, and entertainers. So again, it exists in some form, but nowhere near the size and the volume that it did 20 odd years ago. And that is it for customer needs and expectations, guys. Um, I will see you in the next video when we move on to competitors. Cheers for now.